Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier, and thank you for stopping by. Um, I go back to Mark Rothko, who must be my favourite artist in point of fact. I think, you know, his huge canvases are so um, subtle and deep. The myth holds us, therefore, not through its romantic flavour, not the remembrance of beauty of some bygone age, not through the possibilities of fantasy, but because it expresses to us something real and existing in ourselves, as it was to those who first stumbled upon the symbols to give them life. Put up another painting of Rothko. Go back to two comments of Paul Virilio. Images contaminate us like viruses, and the speed of light does not merely transform the world, it becomes the world. Globalization is the speed of light. He really is um, a great discovery, and I thank Pepe Escobar for that. And then I'll put up that photograph of the rainbow over Nairobi that I like. Political reflections, and there are a few today. Putin says, we pose no threat to anyone and do not intend to get involved in any geopolitical games or intrigues. Uh, interesting comment. West struggles with Russia's ambiguous warfare tactics when Russians cross the border to fight with rebels in eastern Ukraine. Earlier this year, Moscow said the soldiers had not been deployed, but had gone on their vacation time. Western strategists who built their defences to counter a massive invasion nuclear missiles or terrorism are still trying to work out how to cope with this sort of threat that disrupts and destabilizes from behind a mask of deniability. After soldiers without insignia took control in Crimea last March, Western military officials developed their own nickname for Russian personnel operating in unmarked uniforms or in plain clothes, little green men. NATO is considering how to counter such ambiguous warfare techniques should Russian President Putin try something similar in the Baltic member states of Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia. Military experts say Russia's unconventional strategy on its western flank especially non-NATO member Ukraine, is proving remarkably effective. And it has recently been combined with a global show of force on a scale not seen since the Cold War. Russian warships probed the limits of Australian territorial waters before the G20 summit in Brisbane this month, and Moscow said nuclear bomber patrols had been overflying Western Europe would now reach as far as the Gulf of Mexico. Russia's underlying point, analysts say, is clear. It re as it reasserts its influence over countries on its borders, it is reminding the West of how cataclysmic the consequences could be if military force were used to stop them. Putin is taking the measure of the West's willingness to keep exerting pressure on Ukraine. Many officials and experts say privately that both the West and the government in Kiev ultimately will have to accept greater federalism and Russian influence in eastern Ukraine. Um, it's not quite a new Cold War, but it's a very different situation to where we were a few years ago. Uh, the West's biggest response to Moscow's actions have been financial sanctions, which have proven extremely effective. And this sort of undercutting, kneecapping of the oil price. Um, if military deployments in Eastern Europe, further measures are now being discussed in NATO meetings. US Supreme Allied Commander Philip Breedlove makes clear covert infiltration by Russia could draw a military response under Article 5 of NATO's founding treaty, which sees an attack on one member as an attack on the alliance as a whole. Um, and then someone else saying, what you have to remember is that there is simply no option for a conventional war with Russia. 
It is either unconventional like this, or it is likely to become something much worse. And I, you know, spoke about this uh, some time ago when I said, you know, NATO thro has thrown out a whole new characterization of warfare called ambiguous warfare, and that eastern Ukraine has become a shadow zone. M. K. Badrakumo is always very interesting. Has written a piece called Geopolitics as an Aphrodisiac. The sheer depth, he says, of U.S. President Barack Obama's visceral dislike of Putin. It is an animosity felt in the blood and felt along the heart that the usually laid-back president can barely conceal, as the G20 at Brisbane revealed. The Washington Post carried a fascinating opinion piece recently authored by two prominent American pundits who were evaluating how Obama could tackle the two troublesome emerging powers, Russia, China that threatened the US's global hegemony. Their conclusion? They wrote, the good news is that unlike Putin's Russia, China is not committed or destined to a revisionist path. President Obama's trip to Beijing this month demonstrated that it is possible to steer the relationship with China toward a more stable course. Indeed, the heart of the matter is that Russia poses a challenge to the U.S.'s global standing in a way that China does not and cannot for the foreseeable future. At the end of the day, Moscow is the only power on the planet that has the capability to negotiate the global strategic balance with the U.S. China simply lacks that strategic prowess for one or two generations to come. The differentiated approach, which I've been speaking about, I called it the triangle, toward Russia and China on the part of the Obama administration is at once apparent. While the US is piling sanctions on Russia with a view to weaken its economy and force it to curtail its defense budget, which registered a 31% increase in the five-year period from 2008, Obama had a most productive visit to China recently. Pravda ran a headline Tuesday asking, Will Ferguson become Obama's Maidan? I put up a photograph of police standing guard during rioting in Ferguson from the Telegraph. Erdogan slams US impertinence over Kobani. Slammed US rudeness, exposing the extent of strains between Washington and Ankara just days after the president met with the US Vice President Joe Biden. Um, they remained silent in the face of Assad's barbarism and now they are now staging a conscience show through Kobani. Erdogan accused the US of being rude for pressuring it to help save the ISIL besieged Syrian town of Kobani which is within sight of the Turkish border. Why is somebody coming to this region from 12,000 kilometers away, Erdogan said. I want you to know that we are against impertinence, recklessness, and endless demands. They looked on as the tyrant, this is Assad, massacred 300,000 people. They remained silent in the face of Assad's barbarism, and now they are staging a constant show through Kobani. We will resolve our problems not with the help of a superior mind, but with the help of our people. Erdogan accused the West of coming to the region for oil. I'm always meeting with them, but it does not go any further than what I say. They don't have any sensitivities. They have only one sensitivity. Oil, oil, oil. Um, I'll put up a photograph of John Kerry and Erdogan. And then an interesting piece in a, uh, a website called Aussie, O-Z-Y, the wonks waging financial war on Iran. Few people outside a small circle of Middle East policy experts have ever heard of Mark Dubowitz, a diminutive lawyer turned tech exec turned Iran sanctions guru at the DC think tank Foundation for Defense of Democracies. But this past fall, his name was suddenly on the tips of policymakers' tongues at the White House. Congress and allies overseas sparred over thawing relations with Iran after more than 30 acrimonious years. 
At issue, the United States is grappling with how to extend a tentative olive branch to Tehran without dismantling the financial blockade it spent years building. Dibowitz thought he had the solution, a technical financial maneuver resting on the fact that more than a hundred billion dollars of Iran's cash reserves are tied up. Dibowitz thought he had the solution, a highly technical financial maneuver um, it, uh, basically um, freezing the hundred billion dollars of uh, Iran's money. The U.S. could offer Iran access to some of this money and could quickly rescind it if Iran failed to live up to its end of the bargain. And I've said it severally, but President Obama has embraced currency warfare and has been very effective at exploiting this tool. Venezuela, Russia is another example, Iran. Um, and then on the 9th of January, I said, you know, President Obama has deployed a very sophisticated hard power strategy which has encompassed assassinations, evidently, 21st century cyber and currency warfare. Syria, no fly zone not being considered, that's NATO. Put up a photograph of Assad and his wife, and an interesting piece in global research about reconciliation between Saudi Arabia and Qatar and the implications for the war in Syria. The sudden reconciliation between Saudi Arabia and Qatar has enormous implications for the war in Syria and beyond. With the potential to divide the Mideast and North Africa between rulers Abdullah and Thani in a more far-reaching way than Sykes and Pico did nearly a hundred years ago. Saudi Arabia and its Bahraini and Emirati clients ended their Cold War with Qatar last Saturday and reinstated their ambassadors to Doha. They had previously been they had, uh, previously been unprecedentedly withdrawn eight months ago in March to protest Qatar's support for the Muslim Brotherhood, which the kingdom saw as a threat to their rule, um, and saying Egypt will likely be the dividing line between Qatari and Saudi influence during and then talking about the Egyptian scenario. Um, and then saying Qatar is basically going to look at Libya, um, Algeria, and uh, in that direction. Um, put up a photograph of Doha taken from the sky in the early morning as I took up, took off. And you know, this was a schism uh, in the Sunni complex, uh, which seems to be narrowing now. Um, uh, but I, I, I just don't think that these sorts of actions are going to work. Um, they are certainly very destabilizing, as we can see one of the consequences of what happened in Syria was relatively stable. And we might have disagreed with Assad, but it was certainly more stable than it is now. Um, tracking, and then the other point about Qatar, and I wrote a piece a while back about soft power, I was talking about Al Jazeera, but they, they subsequently embraced hard power in a quite extraordinary manner. Uh, I came across Nick Broomfield, who's done some very good documentaries and has a particularly English interviewing style, a little bit like Louis Theroux. Um, and he's done a documentary on Mrs. Thatcher, the unofficial biography of Margaret Thatcher. It's well worth having a look. And then, of course, he's done another one with Eugene Terblanche, and a super one with the story was about Biggie and Tupac. Jesse Felter tweeted, German 10-year yield at a record low. We are seeing the Japanification setting in across Europe. And I think he's right. I think we're going to see lower yields. We're going to see a stimulus program out of the European Union. And uh, we're going to see the euro currency, which is trading at 125.04, um, trade towards 1 uh, in 2015. Dollar index slightly softer, 87.65. Japanese yen 117.38 and uh, the yen has been f strengthening since hitting uh, 118.98 on November the 20th which was the weakest level for the yen since August 2007. Swissy 0.9614 pound that's had a good rebound 157.87 um, got to 155.90 on November 14th um, and has bounced quite strongly since then. Aussie 0.8589, India rupees 61.907, 61.907, 61 
South Korean won 1100, the figure. Um, that's rallied for five uh, straight sessions, longest run of gains in almost five months. Uh, Real 250.10, um, uh, biggest increase amongst uh, developing nation currencies tracked by Bloomberg, Egyptian pound 715, and the South African Rand below 11 at 10.9575. Dollar index, a little bit of backing and filling, but I think you know will be considerably higher next year. Euro dollar, I'm looking for parity in 2015. And then I came across, uh, I've got this fabulous new Galaxy Note 4, and it has this tremendous higher resolution uh, display, 5.7 inch display, which is so pixel dense, uh, it looks closer to a printed photograph than any other phone out there. And I, I second that uh, review in the Wall Street Journal. Coming to the commodity market, Saudi Arabia says no one should cut output, oil will stabilize. Um, the oil minister said tumbling crude prices will stabilize. There's no need for producing nations to cut output. No one should cut and market will stabilize itself. Why Saudi Arabia should cut? The US is a big producer too now. Should they cut? Oil ministers from the 12 nations in OPEC meet today in Vienna. I don't expect uh, any change. Oil is at $72.85. Um, uh, contract uh, uh, lowest close since September 21st, 2010. I think it's going lower still. Another fellow saying OPEC is the main event. Saudi actions over the past month clearly indicate to the market that OPEC is unlikely to agree production cuts, or if they do, the market will doubt the intent to deliver. 13th of October, I said it is the US, and it's interesting that Ali Naimi said the same thing. That is the new price setter for the oil markets, and this is a deep and important geopolitical development. I'll put up a six-month chart, refer you back to that piece I wrote on the 13th of October, who kneecapped oil, and where I said, you know, prices can fall as far as $50 a barrel, crude oil, to Markets overshoot, crude oil does it big time. Um, on the 3rd of November, I spoke of gold. Um, the unwinding of the super cycle will take gold below $1,000 an ounce. I'll put up a six month chart. And then I couldn't resist this photograph from Bloomberg of a sushi chef preparing plates of various sushi at a restaurant in Tokyo, September. Death toll in the world's worst Ebola epidemic has risen to 5,689 out of 15,935 cases reported in eight countries. I wrote about uh, Ebola and I said, you know, it's not really about the absolute numbers, it's the speed of infections or what Virilio calls the escape velocity. When he was Virilio was describing electric electronic money. He says the effectiveness of electronic money lies in its mass, which increases its velocity of circulation. He claims that this is the last post-industrial resource. Acceleration exceeds accumulation. The escape velocity becomes the equivalent of profit. Um, so I was saying, you know, Ebola is not necessarily about the absolute number of cases. It's about its, its escape velocity. Viruses, as we all know, exhibit non-linear and exponential characteristics. Um, I'll put up an image of the Ebola virus. Swapo is headed for a landslide victory, according to Karim Buende, an independent political analyst and former Namibian ambassador to the UN. Take it back to the piece I wrote about Wagadougou's signal to sub-Saharan Africa, where I said the preeminent point to note is that protests in Burkina Faso achieved escape velocity. Paul Wallace tweeted, it's been a tough year for African currencies. Only three, Somalia, Sudan and Djibouti, have strengthened versus the dollar. I'll put up the image. South African all share eased 0.3% yesterday. It's up 8.861% so far this year. Dollar ran back below 11. I still think we'll print 12 next year. Egyptian pound 715. Egyptian stock market rallied 1.34% yesterday. It's up 36 
0.154% so far this year. The Nigerian stock market also bounced, uh, bounced 1.37% uh, to cut its year to date loss to 16.322%. And uh, that's all about, I think, a weaker currency making it uh, more attractive. The Nigerian overnight lending rate doubled to 20%. Angola's Kwanzaa fell to a record low of 100.895 to the dollar on Wednesday. That's the oil story. The Ghana Stock Exchange um, firmed a quarter of a percent yesterday. It's up 6.2% in 2014 annual producer price inflation. It fell to 39.6% in October, down from a revised figure of 47% in September. Moody's saying Sub-Saharan Africa's links to China's economy pose risks to sovereign credit quality in 2015. Um, for Sub-Saharan Africa, downside risks emerge from its links to China's economy with sovereigns demonstrating strong regional trade links facing lower risks than those that rely on commodity exports. The importance for China of China for Sub-Saharan Africa as an export destination has risen to be almost on par with traditional European trading partners, reflecting greater trade integration and a near doubling in Sub-Saharan Africa's share of global trade over the past decade. An interesting piece I came across on Wired, how WhatsApp helped Jumia disrupt African commerce worth reading in full. The issue in Africa, however, has never been demand. The issue has always been supply, which I think is a good point. Yoweri Museveni fumed yesterday that Uganda's Tourism Promotion Board should be renamed the Tourism Suppression Board. The biggest problem with tourism is poor promotion, he said. In Europe, people go to the Mediterranean coast. I visited Spain. It is very hot and humid in the summer. I think Uganda would be a better destination than some of those destinations. Uganda, he argued, was a good place on the globe where you go and have a nice life. We're right on the equator, but because of the high altitude, we have snow-capped mountains. But even where there is no snow, the climate is very mild, very good for the human beings. He said criticizing tourism officials for merely promoting Uganda as having only some chimpanzees and so on. I'll put up a photograph that was on the Guardian website um, for this article. Somalia's new Bourse sees seven firms listing on opening in 2015. Safaricom closed at a fresh record of 1380 yesterday. That's up 31.527% in 2014 on a total return basis. Very strong first half results, which I said beat the street by a wide margin. Um, Talk about mobile data, 3.1 million smartphones on the network. M-Pesa uh, delivered very strong results, and we've had a good price reaction since then. And I did an interview straight after those results uh, with Mr. Colin Moore. We'll have to have a listen. There's lots of interesting points. Kenny Shilling, 19.15. The Nairobi All Shares up 19.297% this year, rallied 1.07% yesterday. Strong move. NAC20 up 0.7% yesterday, up 5.0345% year to date. Emma Metcalf, the Southern Cross Safaris Operations Manager, is talking about Kenyan tourism, said, The industry might not recover in 2017 either due to uncertainties over the forthcoming general election. Hotel occupancy in Mombasa averages 35% compared to 70% in the same period last year. Stands at 20% and 18% in Khalif in Kuali. You know, we've had these problems well telegraphed. In 2012, I said coast problems are deeper than riots. Talking about a 24-7 always-on world. And for a moment, it looked like Mombasa was morphing into Waziristan and a tsunami of travel advisories would be winging their way through the air. Nothing changed for the last since then. And then, you know, we have what, what I called uncorrelated spikes, paroxysms of violence. Now, as concerned, they conflate, become more broad-based and amplified. I put up a photograph of the sunset in Mombasa, another one of the elephants in the Amboseli. 
I linked to an interview I did with Mahmoud Jan Mohammed, where I've covered this specifically in tourism. He is the MD of Serena um, and an old friend. I'll put up, and finally, I'll leave you with a photograph of the Lugard Falls on Christmas Day last year that I took and we wandered around. The snow emerged us and the vastness of the Savo and the sound of the Lugard Falls. It was quite incredible. It's beautiful. There are many beautiful places to visit. Yeah, but it's a shame that the current situation is not allowing it. Thank you.